Okay. Um, good afternoon. I'm happy to uh, welcome you to this third talk on our series on U.S. constitutional history. Today the topic is originalism with Professor Teresa Collette. I am Judy Woodward, the history coordinator of the Ramsey County Library System, and I am so delighted to see so many familiar faces in the crowd and some new ones as well. Before I turn uh, the podium over to Professor Colette, um, I want to remind you that we have two organizations that we must thank. First of all, our great partners, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, who collaborate with us on so many programs, and then our financial underwriter, Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. So thanks to them, thanks to all of you, and now let me turn the podium over to Professor Colette. Thank you. So I see some people have moved their seating in the audience. I'm not sure if they expect tomatoes to be thrown or what. Uh, I am delighted to know that I did not scare a lot of you off. Um, yeah. I turned it on. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn it up just a little bit. And, yeah. Sorry. That's OK. All right, try it again. So let me give one more plug for Mark Osler's presentation. Uh, Professor Osler uh, office is right next door to me. There are many things we disagree about, but the one thing we don't disagree about is he is a wonderful presenter. <laughs> and he's got tons of great experience with the clemency project that he has uh, worked with. And he was very successful under the Obama administration, which might lead you to believe that he couldn't even access the White House now, but he was back from the White House, I think just last month, where he was talking with White House officials about clemency under the federal system. System. So the pardon power he'll be absolutely superb on. So I, I cannot urge you enough to come. Um, so, but that's not the topic of today. Let's sort of finish moving. Well, let me, before I begin, how many of you had a chance to watch the scalia Breyer debate? Excellent. All right. Was it worth it? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a really nice uh, conversation between the two justices and really explain sort of some of the conflict that we're going to see in the cases that we review today. So let me bring us back from the 1930s where we ended last year, our last class, and talk a little bit about a case that precedes that that is a case that still uh, is invoked when we're talking about judicial activism or a failure of the court to give due respect to the text of the Constitution. And the case is Lochner versus New York. And in that case, the question was whether a New York statute that limited workers in bakeries to 10 hours a day and 60 hours a week violated the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Now, we talked a couple of classes ago about the fact that the very meaning of the due process clause uh, has historically been somewhat co contested. One way to interpret it is fairly narrowly, and to interpret it as simply meaning that when the government takes action that uh, impacts your interest, that you must have an opportunity, you must have notice of the proposed action, and you must have the opportunity to be heard about whether the government should go forward with whatever they're going to go forward with. That's a procedural due process requirement. And all scholars, all courts agree that at a minimum, the due process clause under the 14th Amendment and the 5th Amendment require procedural due process, require when the government's going to take actions adverse to your interest that you have notice of that uh, proposed action and the opportunity to be heard. A broader interpretation, uh, which, is, which arises in Lochner as well, is the idea that, well, that process has some sort of content within it. We're looking to find out what sort of interests might you have that the government would have to give you notice of an opportunity to be heard and in this case the claim by the bakery owner who had been convicted not once but twice of violating the new york statute and it was a criminal statute with a 25 dollars fine for the first violation was that 
uh, he had a right to enter into these employment contracts with his employees, with his bakers, free of any government interference, free of any government regulation. And the court said that the New York law maintaining uh, that, uh, that the New York law was not uh, within was within the freedom of contract, and thus the 14th Amendment right to liberty afforded the employer and the employee, sided with the employer and said, you're right, these sorts of government regulations interfere with the right to contract, to hire these people, and so it's invalid under the 14th Amendment. It held that the New York law, and here's the test they used, the New York law failed the rational basis test for determining whether the government action is constitutional. Now we'll learn that there are uh, a variety of tests that the courts use under both the Equal Protection Clause and under the Due Process Clause, but the least onerous for the government is when the court says, does this statute at issue have a rational basis? What, what is the state interest that the, the statute is designed to serve and is that rational? Okay, that's the lowest possible standard. And the court has even goes, gone so far in some cases that when the government can't offer a rational basis, the court will offer one in order to uphold the statute. Now, the reason for that, of course, is that the court is not supposed to be, even under Justice Breyer's view, a super legislature. They are supposed to have a distinct function in our government system, and it's not legislating from the bench. Nobody thinks that's the proper function, okay? And so this rational basis is when the court looks at a statute to see if it's constitutional, they'll say, well, what are the state interests that this statute is aimed to protect? And is it rational to believe that this statute will advance that interest? The majority reasoned in this case that the Bake Shop Act had no rational basis because long working hours did not dramatically undermine the health of the employees and baking's not particularly dangerous. It's not like dynamiting so the railroads can go through, okay? Uh, Justice Harlan, however, dissented, and he argued that the party challenging the law should have the burden of proving that the test was not met rather than requiring the government to prove that the law had a rational basis. And that's part of this idea then that the court will offer a rational basis as well. In other words, they read into the due process clause this private right to contract that thwarted the New York's leg legislative intent to regulate for purposes of protecting the health and welfare of bakers. So Lochner is a, a very famous case and it held sway until we got to West Coast Hotel versus Parish. Now this case um, is a case that came about in the Great Depression. And remember, often then, the court based on this Lochner analysis was overturning federal and state statutes that were designed to get the economy back on track, to regulate the economy in such a way that we could promote economic development because of the depths of the, of the Deep Depression. But the court was having none of it and it was an extremely tense time between the White House and the court. In this case, there was a statute that regulated women's hours because women were seen as more likely to be harmed in their health and having to work long hours, and there was a minimum wage that was attached to it. The court ruled that the state may use its police power to restrict the individual freedom to contract in this instance, so it's the exact opposite outcome than the Bakery case, the Lochner case. The decision is generally regarded as having ended the Lochner era, a period in American legal history in which the Supreme Court tended to invalidate legislation aimed at regulating business, including federal statutes governing child labor. The court was very aggressive in overturning legislation. While Justice Hughes wrote the opinion, the stark doctr doctrinal shift resulted from Justice Owen Robert, Owen Joseph Roberts, uh, changing his perspective on the issues. This is where that face, famous phrase, a uh, switch in time saves nine, comes from. And it's Justice Roberts who was the one who switched to save the number of the court. Uh, according to Hughes, 
pre uh, President Roosevelt's reelection in 36 and the impressive achievements of the New Deal caused Roberts to abandon his affiliation with what was characterized as the court's conservative justices. So you have this competition between the courts and the White House and ultimately Roberts um, changes his position. Now, let me drop a footnote here. We tend to think that nine is some sort of magical number. Some of you might even think that nine justices is written into Article Three, which establishes the Supreme Court. If you believe that, you're wrong. Um, in fact, the court size has varied from as small as seven to as large as 13. And so it often has varied throughout history for various political purposes. And at the time, Justice Roosevelt, part of that saves nine, saying he was threatening to pack the court with an additional four justices. He said, we can solve this problem. I can get a majority. I'm going to push four more through. And then you, you five that are thwarting my will, guess what? <laughs> It'll be great. And so that sort of court politics is nothing new. As perhaps disturbing and concerning as it is in the current day. Well, the 14th Amendment also, remember, part of this jurisprudence limited it in some cases to only those things that went directly to responding to the black co codes, what were called the Jim Crow laws, et cetera. And so in the next, oops, sorry, um, stop, go away, thank you. The next set of cases I want to talk about is how the court was treating race. And we know that Plessy versus Ferguson uh, was in effect from last week's le uh, lecture, which said that given the times and the surroundings of the passage of the 14th Amendment, separate but equal was an adequate response to the mandates of the 14th Amendment. Well, in the 1940s, things began to shift. And a case called Shelley versus Kramer in 1948 really began to foreshadow the court's shifting view of the issue. In that case, there was a, a neighborhood covenant in St. Louis, Missouri that had been entered, in, entered into by all the homeowners in this neighborhood that agreed that the property would not be sold to someone of a different race. It was a white neighborhood and they wanted to exclude anyone of a different race from the neighborhood. Well, one of the individuals living in the neighborhood uh, came time to sell his house, he proposed to actually sell it to a black family. And the Neighborhood Association, the other owners came forward, not the Neighborhood Association as we now know it, but own, other owners came forward and said, whoa, 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 we've got an agreement on this deal. We have an agreement because it's going to protect our property values. And so we've got a legitimate interest in what you do with your property. Now that may sound outrageous, but how would you, and I'm not equating the two, but the idea that neighbors have some interest in what you do with your property is perhaps best illustrated by the guy that leaves the, you know, the broken down cars in his front yard. There's no doubt it impacts, okay? And so the question is, would the introduction of a black family in this case affect the value of the property? But the court didn't look at the question from that perspective. The court looked at the, perspe at the question from the perspective as, can the court enforce this private agreement. Now remember from the last two classes we've talked about, the Constitution is not a limitation on private action. It is only a limitation on state action, except for the 13th Amendment. That's the only time it impacts private action directly. Well here the court said in a unanimous opinion that uh, standing alone racially restrictive covenants did not violate the 14th Amendment. It was private action, just wasn't part of what we were regulating in the Constitution. Private parties may indeed abide by the terms of such a covenant, but they may not seek judicial enforcement of such a covenant, as that that, the action of the court in enforcing it, would be state action which would violate the 14th Amendment. Which would, so you can have whatever contract you want, and the Constitution has nothing to do with it. But if you have to enforce it through the courts, the court said in that case, now you've got a government actor that is enforcing it, and that would violate the 14th Amendment. Now, at one level, this would be a very powerful decision, because essentially it would convert 
lots and lots of private action into state action. If the courts won't enforce our contracts, our labor agreements, a, a variety of different private arrangements, then it essentially undermines that idea that the Constitution is about structuring and constraining the government, not about structuring and constraining private individuals. For that reason, if a lawyer is reduced to citing Shelley versus Kramer, you can pretty much bet they're going to lose. This is one of the few times this ca the case came out this way, and I have actually been reduced to citing it in one case, and I knew what was going to happen. <laughs> I lost. <laughs> All right. The court has not overruled it, but they've given a very, very narrow construction to it. But it does tell you at this point that the court is more and more concerned about the nature of race religions. Simultaneously with this, or at least in the same general time, is when General Eisen President Eisenhower integrated the military. And so there is a change in the way we're viewing race relations in the country going on in the 1940s. And then in the 1950s, in Sweat versus Painter, uh, a black man who was very well qualified for admission to the University of Texas Law School made application. And the, universe, and the state of Texas had established a, a black law school. So it wasn't that he would be precluded from getting a law degree, but he would have to go to the black law school. I believe it's Texas Southern University, which is still in existence in Houston, Texas. But the court, in looking at the nature of the University of Texas degree, its impact throughout the state, said that separate but equal, in this case, violated the Equal Protection Clause, primarily because it simply wasn't equal. So they didn't overturn separate but equal. They just looked and said, I'm sorry, this new foundling little law school down in Houston, Texas, as opposed to the state university, the pride of Texas, that all the governors have come from, no, 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 no. This is not the same thing. If he's qualified to go to the University of Texas, let him in. And so they did. In the same year, they looked at Oklahoma's practice. Oklahoma actually had a statute that outlawed educating multi-races multi in the same educational facility. They established segregation by law. And so there was a student, a graduate student also in the state of Oklahoma, who again was well qualified for the graduate program that he had applied for. And Oklahoma understood that they probably needed him to go to the University of Oklahoma for this particular program because it was unique and, and that was where he could get the education he wanted, but to honor this state law, they essentially made him sit in a different part of the room. He couldn't participate, essentially. And so in this case, again, the court said that um, the University of Oklahoma's admission of a black student isolating him in class did not, did not satisfy the 14th Amendment. Okay, so we've got the beginnings. We're seeing that the court's moving more and more toward this. Now, of course, Thurgood Marshall during this time is litigating these cases. He's developing a strategy to get the court to change its Plessy versus Ferguson uh, decision. And so we come to Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. Now, I suspect many of you all were alive at that time. I don't know if you all were in Minnesota at that time. I can tell you that the state I was in at that time, uh, well, I wasn't, I wasn't even a twinkle in my dad's eye, actually, in 54. Um, but after it, uh, I was born in 56, uh, the public schools in Oklahoma City were absolutely rife with violence. It was a really difficult time. Um, so in Brown versus the Board of Education, as I alluded to last class, there was really a split of opinion among black families because a number of them, given the Texas opinion, where they said, look, these schools aren't equal. <laughs> you, know, you have to allow them into the University of Texas because this alternative you're offering them just is not equal or the equivalent. There were a number of black families that really wanted that strategy pursued in Topeka, Kansas. Now, this was a consolidated case. There were multiple cases that were brought together in this. But there were a number of black families that said, look, we're not, we're not interested in integration. We're interested in qualified teachers, classrooms that are safe, textbooks that are up to date. 
all of the things that make good education possible. That's what we want. And if we can get that, like the man in Texas, we're content. We're content. Now, Marshall didn't agree with that strategy. And there were other families who didn't agree with that strategy, in part because they argued that we've had Plessy versus Ferguson, there have been attempts to equalize the schools, there's no political will to do so. You know, we may get some sort of lip service, but what we need to do is we need access to the white schools because of the resources they have, because of the tax base they have. And so we need to reverse Plessy versus Ferguson. Okay. But, the, but the people who were potential plaintiffs in this case were not of one mind. Okay. And so the court took up the issue, and the question before it was, does the segregation of public education based solely on race, notwithstanding providing facilities that are separate but equal, because they were trying to take it out of that sweat versus painter case, okay, violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And the Supreme Court held that separate but equal facilities are by their nature inherently unequal and violate the protections of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. It reasoned that segregation of public education based on race instilled a sense of inferiority that had a hugely detrimental effect on education and the per personal growth of African American children. And Warren based much of its opinion on information from social science studies rather than court precedent. There wasn't much court precedent for him to rely on given that the court precedent was directly against him. Um, but this is a, among legal scholars, the outcome is not controversial. The rationale is extremely controversial because the opinion as you read it is largely a dissertation on social science, some of which was not even admitted at the trial court. And that's a problem because if social science or history, you saw the justices discussing the use of history or philosophy or any of these other disciplines are introduced as they often are through amicus briefs, there's no cross-examination. I don't get to, I can file a, re, a response brief sometimes depending on the sequence in which briefs are filed, but I don't get to cross-examine the purported expert that holds this opinion. I don't sometimes even get to say, uh, that book was published in 1908 and hardly represents current thinking on the view, or this is a pure politicized statement. Uh, and we see those increasingly in the US Supreme Court. Amicus briefs that try to smuggle in evidence that's not subject to cross-examination. And we see courts rely on it in many cases, which is unfortunate. So Brown versus Board of Education, at least among legal scholars, is not, the outcome is not controversial. But the reasoning is extremely controversial. That's why, and you'll see on the final slide, a list of books that I would recommend. There's a book by Jack Balkan, an edited edition, where he takes a number of prominent legal scholars and they attempt to write the decision that Brown versus Board of Education should have written. They attempt to find the law and they use the materials to actually talk about it from a legal perspective rather than a social science perspective. So that's 1954, and of course, as we all know, it led to huge conflict with its implementation, and not just in the South. Massachusetts had some pretty major riots, too. It was a huge conflict throughout the country. And because of that, we saw the Cooper versus Aaron case, because a number of states tried to avoid the implication. In that case, the court had said it must be done, the integration of schools must be done, quote, with all deliberate speed. Didn't give them a timetable, just said it must be done with all deliberate speed. Well, Arkansas, decided that it would take at least two and a half years to get through that process, in part because you'd be redrawing school boundaries, in part because there, you may not have the resources allocated properly, et cetera. And so the governor and the legislature of Arkansas openly resisted um, the decision in Brown versus Board of Education. And in 1958, members of the school board, along with the superintendent of schools, filed suits urging suspension of the court-ordered plan of desegregation. In a unanimous, and the court worked very hard to make it a unanimous opinion, 
in a unanimous per curiam opinion, um, not signed by any ind individual judge, although every judge was in agreement with it. The court held that Arkansas officials were bound by federal court orders to comply with the court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education. Those of you who were parents during that time know that courts were designing educational systems rather than uh, school superintendents in certain instances because the resistance was so grave. That in of itself is um, somewhat unremarkable. The court has given us an order. Trial courts are going to implement it over the objection of local officials. But the court goes on and makes a statement that actually, as I've characterized it, is this a concept of judicial supremacy or is it a concept of supreme arrogance? The court held that since the supremacy clause of Article uh, 6 of the Constitution made the U.S. Constitution the supreme law of the land and Marbury versus Madison made the Supreme Court the final interpreter of the Constitution. Recall Lincoln questioned that regarding Dred Scott, and there are still people who, who would argue that, that that may be the practice, but certainly there's no textual or historical basis prior to Marbury to take that position. And certainly even Marbury doesn't say they're ex the exclusive interpreter of the Constitution. The precedent set forth in Brown versus the Board of Education was the supreme law of the land and was therefore binding on all the states regar regardless of how many state laws contradicting it. We are, in essence, the Constitution. What we say the Constitution means is what the Constitution means, regardless of the strength of opposition that is evidenced by existing legislation to the contrary. And the court has relied on this position multiple times. In Harper versus the Virginia Department of Taxation, just to pick up that 15th Amendment that we talked about, the voting amendment, um, the question here was whether a state, for purposes of state elections, could have a $1.50 poll tax. In order to vote, you had to pay $1.50. Now again, this is 1966, so it's not the $1.50 today, um, and so there was some evidence that it was intended to be a deterrent, uh, particularly to black voters, but any voters that had limited financial means. Justice Douglas, writing for the majority, said the Equal Protection Clause is not shackled to the political theory of a, partic of a particular era, and the court should not be confined to historic notions of equality. Obviously, uh, Justice Scalia would not agree with that statement. For those of you who watched it, it sounds very much like Justice Breyer. Uh, the living constitution, which uh, Justice Scalia uh, fervently disagrees with. Justice Black, sort of the Scalia person at one in this context, argued the court's justification for consulting its own notions rather than following the original meaning of the constitution, as I would apparently, is based on the belief that the majority of the court uh, is, um, the majority of court that for this court to be bound by the original meaning of the Constitution is an intolerable and debilitating evil. That our Constitution should not be shackled to the political theory of a particular era and save the country from the original Constitution. The court must cons have constant authority to renew it and keep it abreast of this court's more enlightening theories of what is best for our society. And of course, this debate continues today. So for those of you who didn't have an opportunity to watch the Scalia-Briar debate, um, there was a very nice explanation of the difference between Justice Scalia's originalism versus Justice Breyer's uh, living constitution theory. And originalism is different than textualism. Text is a component of it, but some people say, well, then what's the Constitution have to say about the Internet? The Internet doesn't appear in the Constitution. You're absolutely right. The Internet does not appear in the Constitution. The Constitution appears on the Internet, but the Internet does not appear in the Constitution. You are completely right. But the question is, how do we determine when there are broad phrases, how do we determine their application? And every time the Supreme Court decides that something's unconstitutional, they are in effect overruling the political will of the legislature 
that passed the law, whether it's the Congress or whether it's a state legislature. And our theory of government as a general rule is that we the people are in charge through our duly elected representative. We're not pure democracy. We don't you know, have little buttons in our home that we can up or down on House Bill 325, all right? But we do believe, and it was one of the great innovations of our Constitution, that we are capable of self-governance and collective self-governance governance through the properly structured form of a democratic republic, or for those of you who find that distasteful, a republican democracy. Take your pick, all right? And so here are the tests that Justice Breyer set out. He said that when you're looking at a particular constitutional provision, the court should look at the text itself, okay? One of the odd questions that continues, right, to uh, receive some disagreement, at least in the circles that I run in legal academics, is, is flag burning really speech? The statute forbidding it was overturned by speech, uh, the free speech clause, or is nude dancing free speech? We, yes, we have an intermediate court of appeals who said it was because it was expressive. I'm not sure what they were expressing, but nonetheless. Um, and so we look at the text, all right? We look at the history of the text. What were the ills that they were addressing in the text? And then how has the tradition, right, the tradition, how has it been enforced historically throughout our history? And then we look at precedent. Would this be a dramatic change in precedent? We'll see that emerge in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And then important to Justice Breyer, but disputed by Justice Scalia, is the court's understanding of the purpose of the legislation. What was the purpose in passing this particular amendment, this particular constitutional? And then finally, and most hotly disputed by Justice Scalia, the consequences of any particular ruling. The court's reading of the consequences as opposed to the legislative reading of the, con of the consequences. And this is a point that we see in every appellate case. What will the impact be if we rule this way? Is it, and sometimes courts decide that our originalists will say, you know, this is a lousy impact. Justice Scalia's example of the, the student or the child that had to uh, be returned to the Indian tribe, notwithstanding he was happy in the home where the parents had entrusted this child to others because that's what the statute said. And he said, I hated that impact. I hated that outcome. It's a terrible outcome. But it's up to Congress to fix it, not me. The statute was clear. Well, constitutionally, the same thing, okay? Legislative intent, which is used often by courts, and Lord knows I've written enough briefs on, relying on legislative intent. Uh, Justice Breyer mentioned, and it's a common conventional wisdom, that to some degree, relying on legislative intent really is like looking out over a cocktail party and picking your friends. It's largely incomplete. There are many statutes here in the state of Minnesota that we simply cannot find legislative history on it because we didn't start collecting it other than the bill itself. We don't know what the House debates were. We don't know what the triggering uh, circumstances that even caused somebody to introduce the bill was. But we try to find something to hang our hat on. And so legislative intent is an argument that they use. Okay, so thinking about this, should we look at purpose and consequence or limit ourselves to text, history of text, tradition and precedent really is the heart of this debate. So let's move forward and look at some of the controversial opinions. And I give some of these just as history. Loving versus Virginia, of course, is the case where the state of Virginia had an anti-miscegenation law. Now the simple fact was that they were fairly common throughout the South, but were quickly being uh, repealed by state legislatures. So to say that this was representative of southern states at the time simply was inaccurate. But by golly, the Virginia Supreme Court was very clear that they were going to uphold this. And so the question was when uh, the Lovings 
a, a very fine couple who had actually moved to the District of Columbia to avoid the anti-miscegenation law, came home to visit grandparents. Now part of constitutional litigation is finding really sympathetic clients and you can't get much more sympathetic than the lovings. So this couple are bringing their kids home to see the grandparents. They're staying at a hotel and, and the police walk in and charge them with violating this law. And uh, as Mildred Loving tells the story, and I've been to a couple of conferences where she's been present, um, you know, they're terrified. It's late at night, she's actually in her nightgown. Here the cops come in. They're in their mind sort of a normal married couple, notwithstanding that they knew the law existed, and the cops are disrupting it. Well, the Virginia court imposed on them essentially exile. Don't ever come back in the state again, which means, of course, the grandparents either have to travel to see the grandkids or the grandkids will never see the grandparents. That's a pretty great story if you're going to litigate the case. I mean, this is a, this is a good case, all right? <laughs> And so they took it up through the Supreme Court of the state of Virginia, and the state of Virginia said this statute is, is consistent with the laws that were in effect when the 14th Amendment was, was done, separate but equal. Whites can't marry blacks, blacks can't marry whites. There's just no difference here. Thank you very much, we're done. They went to the US Supreme Court, and the court said at least the equal, at the very least, the Equal Protection Clause demands that racial cl classifications, especially suspect in criminal statutes, be subjected to the most rigid scrutiny. Remember, remember our rational basis for the bakers? Well, now we got rigid scrutiny. Very different standard of review. And if they are to be upheld, they must be shown to be necessary, not simply rational, but necessary to the accomplishment of some permissible state objective independent of the racial discrimination, which was the object of the 14th Amendment. These statutes deprive the lovings of liberty without due process of law in violation of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. The freedom to marry has long been recognized as one of the vital rights essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness by free men. Now I wanna just pause for a minute and talk about, then the court offers two constitutional arguments. The first is equal protection, and the way you win in an equal protection case is that you show that the two groups are similarly situated, okay? If they're not similarly situated, it's not a problem. That's why eight-year-olds can't drive, but 16-year-olds can, okay? That's why eight-year-olds can't vote, but 16-year-olds can, okay? Or 21-year-olds can. There was a proposal in California to make it 16, but that's a whole other story for another time. 18 now, 18 now, 21 when I was a girl, you're right. Um, so equal protection says you have to show that they're similarly situated. Well, in this case, they were similarly situated, and then the law has to apply the same way. Due process, on the other hand, due process, this substantive due process concept, is that there are certain rights that are fundamental, that when government seeks to restrict them, government has to have a very strong justification. But it's a different argument than equal protection. Equal protection is, are we teach, treating everybody the same? All equally bad, all equally good, doesn't matter. We're good, all right? Due process is, this is the essence of being free in many ways, okay? Two different arguments, and they get blended. Griswold versus Connecticut is probably, if you will, the genesis of most of the sexual politics cases, which are among the most controversial opinions of the court now. In Griswold versus Connecticut, there was a law in Connecticut which the record shows had not been enforced for 40 years. And on that, the statute said that it was illegal to provide contraception in that state, and it was illegal for married couples to use contraception, or at least the plaintiffs were married couples in that case. No one was being prosecuted, and the statute was really only enforced for purposes of keeping birth control clinics. So if you went to your private doctor and they gave you contraception and you were married, there were lots of women using contraception at the time and the law was disinterested. The case was really about somebody who wanted to open a birth control clinic in New Haven. Yale, not to bring sex and Yale together again, but, <laughs> okay. So 
this was really about can they open a clinic? And the court could have, as it previously did just a few years earlier in a similar case, not on a Connecticut statute, but another statute, say, look, it's not even being enforced. You don't even have a real plaintiff here. We're not, no, we're not going to answer this question. This is a pretend question, and, and we're not in the pretend business, okay? But they chose not to. And instead, they incorporated into constitutional doctrine this idea of a right to privacy. We deal with a right of privacy older than the Bill of Rights, older than our political parties, older than our school system. And then listen to the way they characterize marriage. Marriage is a coming together for better or worse, hopefully enduring and intimate to the degree of being sacred. It is an association that promotes a way of life, not causes, a harmony in living, not political faiths, a bilateral loyalty, not commercial or social projects. Yet it is an association for as noble a purpose as any involved in our prior decisions. And so the opinion turns on what they characterize as the intrusiveness of the statute into the marital bedroom, into the, the if you will, the sanctuary of the married couple. And they strike it down, okay? Well, just a few years later, they get the same case, only it's whether or not you can have a statute that prohibits the sale of contraception to single people. So if the rationale of the first case is that there's something unique and special about married couples, in fact, in its most crude explanation, a marriage license is really a license to have sex at the time. Because we had adultery laws and we had fornication laws and we had bigamy laws, we still have the bigamy laws and we actually still have adultery laws on the books in at least 20 states. But it was basically a license to have sex. Why would, did we license sex? Because of the very simple fact that sex between a man and a woman has the great potential to make babies. And we thought we ought to sort of control the circumstances in which children were born into. And so if you were going to stand up and say, I'm going to have sex with this woman and be responsible for the consequences, awesome. That was the marriage license. Okay. Well, Eisenstadt v. Baird is not that same case. And yet, in 1972, the court struck down a Massachusetts statute prohibiting the sale of contraceptives to single people. The court rejected the state's argument that the government had a strong interest in restricting use of contraception to married couples and opined that there's no constitutionally significant difference between married couples and single people for equal protection analysis. Remember? So the court says, oh, Sex between two adults, doesn't matter if they're married or not, there's no constitutional difference in them. It offered a dramatically different understanding of marriage as, quote, not an independent entity with a heart and mind of its own, but an association of two individuals, each with a separate intellectual and emotional makeup. This is the beginning of what many of us consider sort of the radical individualism that we see coming through many court opinions. It's all about me. And there are no enduring unions that are separate and independent and have unique and special constitutional status. The court mocked those who defended the law as an aid to, yes, that old fashioned phrase, chastity, which is not celibacy. Celibacy is no sex. Chastity is sex in the proper setting. Very different. Celibacy is what your 16 year old should engage in. <laughs> chastity as a married woman is what you should engage in. Um, it would be plainly unreasonable to assume that the state had prescribed pregnancy and the birth of an unwanted child for the physical and psychological dangers of an abortion, and they are signaling heavily that the next case coming down the pike as punishment for fornication. So we become, uh, the pill was authorized for sale by the FDA in the mid-60s, and by 1972 they've struck down uh, both restrictions on its sale. Then we get to Roe versus Wade, and I'm acutely aware that many people believe that the current uh, battle, confirmation battle, is about uh, primarily the continuing, uh, the continuance of Roe versus Wade. Uh, not all people believe that, uh, but a number of people believe that that is the case. There was an op-ed to that effect today in the Wall Street Journal. Roe versus Wade came out of the state of Texas. We know now that Norma McCorvey, who was Jane Roe, uh, was not raped, as her lawyers asserted. 
At the time, the state of Texas statute did not have a rape exception. It did have a life of the mother exception. Uh, and we also know that she already had a child um, and that the case was brought to the court on the argument that the state's statute that restricted abortion uh, violated this privacy right that was first articulated in Griswold versus Connecticut. So what a long way we've come from contraception to abortion in a very short period of time. Um, the court, and I tell my students in class when I teach this case, uh, I would flunk any student who used this constitutional analysis, and it's not just because, and I will be very clear, I disagree with the opinion, um, but the court was unable to identify the text from which this right to privacy emerged in the context of abortion. The court said, and I'm quoting the opinion, this right of privacy, whether it be founded in the 14th Amendment concept of personal liberty and restrictions on state action, that's that due process clause, right? Or, as we feel it is, or as the district court determined in the Ninth Amendment, reservation of the rights uh, to the people is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. Now, an interesting historical point that many of you may not know is prior to Roe versus Wade, there had actually been a vote in the state of Washington a popular vote in the state of Washington, a referendum on abortion law. And they had, in fact, uh, removed restrictions on abortion during the first phases of the pregnancy. They had uh, enacted basically a statutory scheme that required parental consent for minors and required husband's participation in the decision. But they had legalized it by a vote of the people. New York had also legalized it by a vote of the legislature. At the time of the opinion of Roe versus Wade, there were six states that had already legalized abortion. It was a raging political battle in the states, but it was not as if the court's intervention was promulgated on the absence of any sort of political movement on this, in this area. There was, in fact, uh, substantial political movement in this area. So they rule that the right to abortion exists. They rule uh, the court, state of Texas argues that in fact uh, abortion is illegal in part to protect the life of the unborn child. And the court takes the position that that is specious and that uh, in its words, as philosophers and theologians and others cannot agree on when personhood, a constitutional concept be uh, begins, it is not of sufficient uh, weight to over come this putative privacy right. The court also characterizes it as disingenuous on the part of the state of Texas, saying that if in fact it was about protecting the life of an unborn child, why would they allow an abortion uh, in the context of the life of the mother? And I think the answer to that question is because when you have two innocent citizens, who, one of whom is going to die, it's a perfectly reasonable political choice for the state to stay out of that decision it won't pick between innocent citizens, which is the way I justify uh, the viability uh, part of Roe versus Wade, where the court says that after the pregnancy proceeds to the time of viability, then in fact a state can largely prohibit it subject to the health of the mother. The same argument would apply. When a woman can uh, be uh, freed of an unwanted pregnancy through giving birth as opposed to having an abortion ending that potential human life as the court characterizes it, the court recognizes the state's ability to say then you have to choose giving birth because we can respect both the rights of this potential human being as well as the rights of the woman at that instance. Interestingly, the viability r rule was not briefed before the court. There was no briefing on that question at all when the court issued its opinion. The same day the court issued, and this is why many of, the, many of us who believe that this uh, constitutional interpretation is incorrect, say that abortion is constitutionally protected throughout the entire nine months. Uh, in Doe versus Bolton, it was the interpretation of a, a statute, I believe out of Georgia, uh, and the question was, was the two-doctor consent requirement to have an abortion in a hospital constitutional? And it said that the doctors must make this determination based on the health of the woman. The court interpreted the statute as saying the medical judgment regarding abortion may be exercised in light of all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and the woman's age relevant to the well-being of the patient. 
All these factors may relate to health. And in fact, one of the authors of an abortion textbook testified in Congress that any time a woman says, I don't want this baby, I find it upsetting that she has, she falls within the health exception because she is emotionally unhappy with the pregnancy. So for that reason, there are many uh, lawyers even, and there are cases where the health exception has been defined incredibly broadly, much broadly, more broadly than most of us would anticipate. I would also note that in the state of Minnesota, we have no viability ban. Abortion is lawful in this state through the entire nine months of pregnancy. We had a viability ban, and the courts overturned it. They said it was too vague, uh, and we have not passed any legislation. So in the state of Minnesota, uh, abortion is lawful uh, in all nine months. It is also protected by the state constitution as an interpretation of the state constitution. So should Roe versus Wade be overturned tomorrow, something that I don't expect, um, but should it, abortion would remain legal because of Doe versus Gomez, a Minnesota Supreme Court opinion, unless the United States Supreme Court in some bizarre universe ruled that the unborn child is indeed a human being and therefore must be protected. But the more likely interpretation is simply that the Constitution doesn't speak to the issue and we leave it to the political process to make its decision. We are one of several states that have state constitutional protection independent of federal. Well, 1973 was watershed. Uh, people have been marching in Washington in January ever since. And uh, in 1992, a lot of folks thought that Roe versus Wade was going to be reversed. And in fact, when you read the history uh, and the personal papers of some of the justices that have now become available, uh, it was very close to being reversed. But Justice Kennedy um, yielded to the arguments of Justice O'Connor and changed his initial position that Roe versus Wade should be reversed. Again, reversing it simply to return it to the states, not to make it um, illegal to not have a ban on abortion. The opinion has been mocked in many cases uh, because the rationale they give us, and this is their due process argument about what liberty under the due process is, is that at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the mystery of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Recall Justice Scalia's comment about maybe the court should just be comprised of nine philosophers. This is called the mystery passage. Um, there is no legal basis uh, for that particular view of what the meaning of life is. And I can guarantee you, between the University of Minnesota and St. Thomas University, if we got 12 philosophers in a room, we would not have agreement on what the meaning of life is under any philosophical scale. But this was their due process justification. Uh, Justice O'Connor, um, and I, to my great disappointment, because it was Justice O'Connor, who wrote, the ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated by their ability to control their reproductive lives. In other words, we have to have abortion in order for women to participate in the economy and in the public square. That is a very troubling condition, if that is true. And the, I am currently involved in a pregnancy discrimination case where the employer thinks that it is okay to condition access on abortion. But we have a statute that says he can't. So he will be paying a great deal of money at the end of the case. Um, but the hard work of reforming, uh, the hard work of reforming the workplace and reforming universities and reforming society where pregnancy is not a disability but is simply part of the natural biological life of a woman who, who chooses to have a child is in many people's opinion, stymied by this idea that abortion is a necessary and appropriate um, way of dealing with the fact that women's biology is different than men. We have to, in effect, live a man's biological life if we want to have that condition. The court goes on to say, the fact that a law which serves a valid purpose, one not designed to strike at the right itself, that has an incidental effect of making it more difficult or more expensive to procure an abortion cannot be enough to invalidate it. So you can have certain limitations on it. This is the regulation, and this was the compromise that the court arrived at. Only where the state regulation imposes, and here's the legal phrase you'll read about in the papers anytime there's an abortion case, an undue burden 
on a woman's ability to make this decision, does the power of the state reach into the heart of liberty protected by the Due Process Clause? What constitutes an undue burden was not defined by the court and has led to a great deal of litigation um, so that you find things like abortion clinic regulations requiring doors to be wide enough for an ambulance to go, th uh, an ambulance trolley to go through uh, are an undue burden because of the cost to the clinic. You have other cases that say that's nonsense. This is a health and safety regulation and we've seen women having to be physically carried out of clinics when there's a, when there's a need for emergency response. Um, so the court continues to, to struggle with the definition. So that's one area, and I've probably offended half of you. Let me see if I can get to the other half. <laughs> All right. Um, the other area, of course, is uh, homosexual conduct. Um, in Bowers versus Hardwick, there was a Georgia statute uh, that uh, criminalized uh, an act of anal intercourse uh, between members of, uh, between any two people, period. It was generic. And the court in that case upheld it and said at the time the Constitution was enacted, at the time the 14th Amendment was enacted, these sorts of codes, uh, legislative codes related to sexual conduct is something that um, has never been challenged. And if you don't like it, the answer is go to your legislature. Have it repealed. It is not that we are saying states must have these statutes. It's saying we're saying the Constitution doesn't keep them from, having, from doing it. In 2000, uh, let me drop a footnote. I was involved in Lawrence versus Texas, so clearly I have a perspective, represented clients in the case. Um, but one of the interesting things I learned in that is that prosecutors often used the anti-sodomy law as a backup to rape cases where sodomy had occurred because the physical evidence of forcible sodomy is much easier to, to obtain than the physical evidence of forcible sexual intercourse. Uh, the body is just different and the injuries are more marked and more clearly identified uh, in the other. Um, and so if you test it by the rational basis, these prosecutors would argue that such a law makes sense. Now, Texas's law, though, was a very odd law, and um, we all knew that we were not, uh, that we were unlikely to prevail, not because of the political wins, but because unlike Georgia that said, look, these two parts aren't supposed to go together, this is a health question, we're not doing this, all right? The Texas law said it was only between members of the same sex. So the same conduct by an opposite couple was lawful, but not by a same-sex couple. And so that alone gives a significant uh, equal protection argument that was presented to the court. Interestingly, because the court and equal protection was argued strenuously in the briefs, uh, it was the court chose not to go through equal protection because they saw the marriage issue brewing <laughs> but instead chose to go through the due process clause. So they didn't have to say they weren't similarly situated, which would be a rational argument given the Texas statute unavailable to them in Bowers versus Hardwick. Uh, instead, it says um, that the case does not involve minors, which is true. It does not involve persons who might be injured or coerced or who are situated in relationships where consent might not be easily refused. It does not involve public conduct. So basically it's saying, we're not touching those statutes. You know, bring them back to us if you think there's a problem, but we're not touching them. It does not involve that the government must give formal recognition, that's the marriage, to any relationship that homosexual persons seek to enter. The consent. Uh, this case does involve two adults who, with full and mutual consent from each other, engaged in sexual practices common to a homosexual lifestyle. The petitioners are entitled to respect of their private lives. We're going back to Griswold. The state cannot demean their existence or control their destiny by making their private sexual conduct a crime. Their right to liberty under the Due Process Clause gives them a full right to engage in the conduct without intervention. Not an equal protection case a due process case. So now the liberty phrase in the Constitution has been interpreted to uh, mean this private sexual conduct between two consenting adults. All right, so the, in contrast, just to put these cases in contrast, let's talk for just a minute about the suicide case. Washington versus Gluck, uh, Glucksburg was a companion case to Vaco versus Quill. 
And these were challenges to the New York statute and the Washington statute that prohibited assisting with suicide. Now, this was also the time when Dr. Kevorkian, many of you may remember that name, Dr. Kevorkian was plying his trade throughout the country. Um, and there were multiple trials of Dr. Kevorkian, and they ultimately, when Dr. Kevorkian um, taunted and demanded that the prosecutor charge him only with murder, um, they ultimately won because juries tended to be sympathetic enough to him that they would not have convicted him of murder, but rather would have given uh, voluntary manslaughter. But he had argued in front of the judge, pro se, um, that by golly, if they believe it's murder, they ought to say it's murder. And so he went to prison. These laws were under attack in 1997. And the statutes were defended on the part of the government by saying that uh, the state has an interest in preserving human life. They have an interest in preventing suicide, which is a public health problem right now, especially among elderly men. Uh, avoiding the influence of third parties, use of arbitrary, uh, unfair or undue influence. Our nurse case here in Minnesota where the nurse was encouraging people to kill themselves. Protecting family members and loved ones. Often courts particularly look at whether they're small children that still are being raised in the family. Protecting the integrity of the medical profession and avoiding future uh, movement toward euthanasia or other abuses. The American Medical Association actually briefed on the side of Washington and the side of New York in these cases, in contrast to the, the fact that they brief against the states and the abortion cases. So one of the things that is an interesting way to look at these, these cases is when you've got the AMA, you're probably going to win. When you don't have the AMA, you're probably going to lose. The court then found that throughout the nation, Americans are engaged in an earnest and profound debate about the morality, legality, and practicality of physician suicide. Uh, our holding permits this debate to continue as it should in a democratic society. They left it to the legislatures. They said this is not a constitutional issue. We are not going to constitutionalize it. Uh, couple more, one more area, affirmative action. Um, many of you may remember the Bakke case in 1978. This was a medical school out of California uh, that uh, had a racial set-aside, 16 seats out of 100 seats for certain minority groups. And there wasn't a majority opinion out of this case. In fact, there were six different opinions out of this case. Uh, four of the justices would have upheld the program on the ground that the government can use race to remedy disadvantage cast on minorities by past racial prejudice, but only four. The court has subsequently uh, disavowed that rationale. So a state can't defend using race as, a, as the determining factor based on past discrimination or injury. Justice Powell, who actually now in education cases is the dominant uh, theory, even though he provided the fifth vote reversing the state's court's injunction against any use of race be, uh, whatsoever, in part of his opinion that was joined by no other justices, he expressed the view that attaining a diverse student body was a sufficient state interest um, asserted by the university that survived scrutiny. Grounding his analysis in academic freedom, he said that uh, it has long been viewed as a special concern of the First Amendment. So affirmative action in educational institutions when it is used for educational purposes and academic excellence is constitutionally permissible, not so in other contexts such as employment. Well, more recently, though, of course, we had the Grutter opinion out of Matt, uh, Michigan where a student applied and was uh, not allowed entry. And the court, Justice O'Connor writing for the majority said, we take the law school at its word that it would like nothing better than to find a, racial a race neutral admission formula and will terminate its race-conscious admission programs as soon as practicable. It has been 25 years since Justice Powell first approved the use of race to further an interest in student body diversity in the context of public higher education. Since that time, the number of minority applicants with high grades and test scores has indeed increased. We expect that 25 years from now, that would be 2028, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary to further the interest approved today. So Justice O'Connor put a time limit on there. Now, whether the court will actually uphold it, I don't know. 
In summary, the Equal Protection Clause does not prohibit the law's narrow, law school's narrow use of race in admissions decisions to further a compelling interest in obtaining the educational benefits that flow from a diverse student body. So affirmative action in that context has been upheld, but with a time limit. And then let me turn to our final case before I open it up for conversation. The Obergefell versus Hodges case, of course, that is the case in which the Supreme Court for the country redefined marriage, notwithstanding that 32 states during the time period immediately prior to that had enacted either legislation or constitutional amendments defining marriage as the union of one man and one woman. The court held that the due process clause of the 14th Amendment guarantees the right to marry. We've seen that with the description of marriage in uh, Griswold versus Connecticut, and there were earlier cases, as one of the fundamental liberty it protects. And that analysis applies to same-sex couples in the same manner as it does to opposite-sex couples. Judicial precedent, that was one of the factors, of course, that the justices agreed is an appropriate concern, has held that the right to marry is a fundamental liberty because it is inherent to the concept of individual autonomy. It protects the most intimate association between two people. It safeguards children and families by according legal recognition to building a home and raising children. And it has historically been recognized as the keystone of the social order. Because there are no differences, equal protection analysis, because there is no difference between a same-sex union and an opposite-sex union with respect to these principles, the exclusion of same-sex couples from the right to marry violates the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. The equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment also guarantees the right of same-sex couples to marry, as a denial of the right would deny same-sex couples under the protection of the law. Again, I want to stress, in Minnesota, we are the only state in the union, but we had a vigorous and full public debate <laughs> on this issue. And proponents of the constitutional amendment lost and opponents of the constitutional amendment won and enacted a legislatively enacted definition of marriage that encompassed any other two consenting adults who are legally available to marry. All right, no threesomes, just twosomes. <laughs> this opinion imposed that same choice on legislatures and states where the people had had a similar debate but come to a different conclusion based on its interpretation of due process and equal protection. Masterpiece Cake, of course, was just last session. You all are familiar with the Baker case. I won't spend much time on it, but the question is, if people who continue to hold sincere, and in that case, religious beliefs, that marriage has a particular content, that being the union of one man and one woman, because they are participating in the commercial life of this country, because they are supporting themselves through earning money in a public area, can they be forced to act in a different way? And the court said no, not in that instance. We have our own Minnesota case uh, going through the courts right now with videographers, and we will see how the courts deal with the case. But these are ongoing controversies. And then the slide I will leave up is a set of recommended books um, that can perhaps be sent to those that have emails, that uh, Judith has your emails, but I would point out in particular the two that I think you'll find the most interesting because it's sort of like the video in that you're going to get both sides and the best arguments on both sides are the two Jack Balkan books. Uh, what Brown versus Board of Education should have said, the nation's top legal experts rewrite America's landmark civil rights decision. And what Roe versus Wade should have said, the nation's top legal experts rewrite, rewrite America's most controversial decision. Um, again, I should uh, admit that I am uh, one of the authors, I have a, a dissenting opinion in that case, that recites the history of women's involvement in the political and commercial life of this country. Um, the other books, Justice Accused, I mentioned the first uh, class. It's a wonderful book about how uh, men uh, of goodwill and men who were abolitionists could continue to sit on the benches at the time that we had the uh, slavery uh, laws that required a return of a slave to their owner. And then the other book I mentioned, the first class, that I think is a very readable, very entertaining, uh, but very uh, learned book, uh, Mike Paulson, he also is a colleague of mine, The Constitution and Introduction. So the uh, 
founding fathers, Akhil Amar, as well as Andrew, Andrew, Alexander Bickel. Those of you who are particularly interested in judicial activism, Alexander uh, Bickel's book is a bit dense, but it's really good, and it's cited by the Supreme Court regularly, so it's worth reading if you want it, to. It's dense. It's not bedtime reading. Um, the Constitution you can read as a bedtime book. This one, mm -mm, you got to have your cup of coffee and start early. So. <laughs> Okay, so let's open it up because I've made a lot of controversial comments. I've shared a lot of controversial views. Let it begin. <laughs> okay, and I will bring around the microphone, but I also wanted to say uh, anyone who's thinking of, you know, madly scrolling, uh, scribbling down these titles, I'll just send out an email with this slide to everybody, so don't worry about it. Who has a question? Who has the first question? And I'm going to ask people, when you have a question, hold the mic down. For some reason, it's, it's up further than it should be, I guess. So don't bring it up to your mouth. And I think we'll all be able to hear. Got it? Thank you. You, you mentioned uh, federal, uh, um, originalism and living constitution. Are there other active uh, theories of constitutional interpretation? There are other theories in the academic literature, but not actively on the Supreme Court. Uh, but there's different application, right? I mean, as you, if, if you saw the debate, Justice Scalia said, sure, sometimes the purpose is clear. Certain states require you have a purpose uh, provision in the legislation itself, and so that's pretty easy, uh, as opposed to trying to look at legislative intent. Um, so the two main competing concepts really are, uh, originalism, uh, we want to look at the purpose and the text and its original uh, purpose, if you will, and then the, the living constitution. And the argument, of course, is that, um, as Justice Scalia said, we have a perfectly fine amendment process. Uh, and we actually have amended the constitution fairly quickly sometimes when the court got it wrong. Um, and in other times, we haven't. Uh, the argument on the other side, though, is that you have a body of law that um, really is inconsistent with the spirit of liberty uh, that it, it informs the Constitution. Um, and so people of good faith uh, can embrace one or the other. Uh, I will say that. Um, Judith knew that I was an originalist, um, and I appreciate um, having the opportunity to present that viewpoint. Uh, it's not always true in lots of forums. This lady has a question, and do hold the mic down. So you said in loving in here, here, here. Okay. <laughs> So you said in Loving and in the case, the Texas case about Lawrence homo versus Texas. homosexual relations, in both cases, they were about the Supreme Court saying a behavior that was okay, due pro the due process. So why couldn't the same be said about a woman's right to an abortion? It's another behavior. It is another behavior, although it's also a commercial transaction. It's not a private action, although we do have the advent of uh, the medical abortions where you can use pills, right? So you've got the, the phone it in or internet abortions that are occurring now. Um, but I think the question is, does the court get to put the question of what was, what that is within the woman? Is it a human being or not? And what I didn't put in this presentation, um, the Eighth Circuit, in an en banc opinion, meaning all the judges of the Eighth Circuit sat on this one. This is, isn't a three-judge panel. This is all the judges. We, are, we sit in the Eighth Circuit. We live in the Eighth Circuit. The Eighth Circuit had before it a South Dakota statute that specifically said, it's the Rounds versus Planned Parenthood opinion, uh, that specifically said that an abortion provider must inform a woman that abortion terminates the life of a separate, unique human being. And it had a definition of human being, a scientific definition of human being. And Planned Parenthood sued, saying that it was false and misleading, and that uh, the state cannot require professionals to make false and misleading statements, which is true. That's a correct constitutional principle, thank goodness. Um, and that even if it weren't false and misleading, that the 
abortion providers ought not be required to say something that they disagree with. The Eighth Circuit en banc said that the, said that the statute was constitutional, and in an important review of the evidence before the court, which was it, there was a lot of evidence, a lot of expert witnesses in this case, which is not true of most abortion cases. In that particular case, the court said that Planned Parenthood could present no evidence that the, that which is within the woman, they didn't use that phrase, but was not a human being. All of the evidence on the record proved that it was a human being as scientifically, as scientifically defined. And if you look at the embryology text, if you look at a number of medical texts, that's not in dispute. The dispute is whether it's a person entitled to constitutional protection. But let's stop and ask ourselves how much we like the idea that there are human beings that are not constitutionally protected as persons. I think we've been down that road once. I understand you don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> I see a quick hand up over here. Well, this is a follow-up to the same glamorous topic. And um, I've uh, served as a volunteer lobbyist. Um, and Minnesota has had some pretty crazy laws proposed, whereas women could not cross a state border to get an abortion. It didn't pass. But I, when I would just go and meet with the legislators, I'd go, well, how do you implement that? And what exam does every woman need? And what passport do they need to get across a state border to come back? Um, anytime a, a, a law is looked at or an interpretation, I always think, what is the practical implication? And um, how, is that, how is that implemented? And so the, the point about potential personhood or personhood or viability or not, that also would affect every estate. Somebody dies, what, all the women have to be examined to see if they Can I stop you right there? In fact, the law in every state is that a child in utero is an heir. Okay. That is the law. And that is the law as acknowledged in Roe versus Wade. A child is a child for personal injuries that are suffered in utero in most states. A child is a child for purposes of inheritance. So, but they're not a child for purposes of abortion. I saw a hand up over here. Who's, yes. I, I think I heard Justice Ginsburg state that she believed, who I respect and admire, that she believed that the Roe versus Wade decision was a problem. And I think you explained, if that's what you did explain, how it was because of its how, because of its justification at the time. So, did I understand what you said? If you said that you believed the viability issue was important, so that abortions would or could be legal in under three months, something like that. And then the next question is probably the bigger one: is um, do you think the appointment of Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court jeopardizes the Roe versus Wade decision? Let me take them in reverse order. Okay. My answer to the second is sadly no. I don't. Um, and I, I don't think, I, I will be surprised if Roberts would vote to reverse Roe versus Wade. Um, so I think that both sides are highly emotional over something that if it happens, is not going to happen quickly. And I think they both misrepresent the consequences of if it happens. Because as I said, Roe versus Wade could be reversed tomorrow, and we've still got Doe versus Gomez. It's just going to move the fight to the states. California has a Doe versus Gomez. Florida has a Doe versus Go Go Gomez. Uh, there are multiple states. As I said, Washington did it through a referendum. Okay. Lots of states, it's not going to automatically reinstate the pre-existing prohibitions on abortion. In fact, we have a Tenth Circuit opinion to that case because Norma McCorvey actually tried to reverse 
Roe versus Wade, the woman who was Roe, <laughs> all right? And we have a Tenth Circuit opinion to that case. It's desuetude. Desuetude is a legal term for when statutes haven't been enforced for so long. You know, you can't, you can't tie your horse up to the, main, to the lights in, on Main Street. Well, guess what? If you tried to enforce it today, we'd have a problem, okay? So I think the pro-life side suggests that we're going to have this wave of protection for the unborn, and I think the pro-choice side pr suggests the handmaiden's tale is going to become reality in every state in the union. The handmaiden's tale is not going to become reality in any state in the union, and we're not gonna have a wave of pro-life legislation. We'll have some. We will probably have parental consent laws in the vast majority of states. We will probably have, we may even have husband consent laws with exceptions in some states. We may have, as you suggest, gestational limits like all the European countries have, which says that after a certain point in time, you can't have an abortion unless you have a threat to the health, meaning a substantial impairment of a woman's physical uh, condition. We may have uh, we may outlaw the internet abortions, which is a little scary given the hemorrhaging that can occur with no doctor present. We may have any number of sorts of regulatory, and yes, there'll be a few states that abortion will be largely illegal, but neither side is going to, by reversal of Roe, have a massive defeat or massive victory, and that's just based on state law, unless they all decide it's a human person, which I don't think they will. Well, and then, a, oh, I'm sorry, your me, other sorry. question. Sir, what your belief was about three months, the viability. Uh, the, the viability part of the, among scholars who study this on both sides, which is why Jack Balkin did the book, uh, What Roe Versus Wade Should Have Said, the fact that viability wasn't even proposed to the court and the court just out of its own set a new rule and they actually went to, uh, it was actually written at Mayo, Mayo's library up here. The opinion was actually written up here. Um, so uh, it, nobody's comfortable with the Supreme Court suddenly picking a new theory that nobody's briefed, nobody's had an opportunity to put evidence in. That's just not the way it should work. Um, but sometimes it's attacked, well, viability is just arbitrary and ridiculous. I don't think it's arbitrary and ridiculous. I do understand the argument that we believe that this potential human life, I think it's human life, not just potential, but we, we're troubled by this competition of rights, the clash of absolutes, and so if we can give the woman freedom from her pregnancy while also protecting the life of that potential human life, we're gonna, we're gonna do that, and that's why viability makes sense as a line to draw, uh, because at viability she can uh, induce labor and, and the child is there. One of the questions I ask my students regularly is the right to abortion, a right to be free of an unwanted pregnancy, or is it the right to kill? And when you look at the frozen embryo cases, the embryo cases to a, without exception, at the highest level, there are some trial court opinions to the contrary, but at the highest level have always felt that, the, have always held that the person who did not want continuation of the development of those e embryos wins, okay? Larry Tribe discussed this. Larry Tribe is on the opposite side of this issue from me, constitutional law professor from Harvard. But he said, if we ever develop an artificial womb where the embryo or fetus can be removed by an in-office uh, procedure with very little risk to the woman, we'll have to rethink the right to abortion. Because if the father wants the child to continue in development in that artificial womb, does the woman have the right to say, no, I want it killed instead? Is it a right to kill? Or is it a right to be free of an unwanted pregnancy? Those are two very, very different things. Another question? Okay, I see over here. I really appreciate the faces are, I'm sure I'm making people uncomfortable, but everybody's being so respectful, and I really do. You all aren't a college campus. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure quite how to phrase this. I have two concerns about overturning or limiting Roe v. Wade. One, I, and I'm certainly no lawyer, um, I wonder whether the rights of poor women and the rights of women 
in states where extreme limits are placed on things, the distance between clinics that have rights and so forth, whether that violates the equal protection of those women. And the second element is if I accept the idea that before viability that I have, or if I accept right down to conception, that I have two human beings, why is it that the child's right to life, which is totally dependent on the mother's physiology, why is that supposed to take precedence over the mother's desires? So you've asked multiple questions, so let me try to remember them all and, and answer them. Um, I, I briefed in Texas Women's Health, the most recent Supreme Court decision uh, on the abortion laws, and there are greater distances to neonatal units than there are to abortion. So we often hear this idea that abortion clinics, the distances are so uniquely and uh, it's a unique procedure in that we can't get to the clinics in the same way. There are plenty of medical services that have large geographic dis distances that are available to them. So that, what, they're, what they're doing is they're cherry picking which medical procedures are saying that um, an abortion clinic is more important even than a neonatal unit for a child that's born prematurely. I, I don't share that. I think distribution of medical services. The other thing that we discovered in uh, Texas in particular is that uh, the Texas Women's Health, uh, part of their concern was because Planned Parenthood was consolidating their services and Planned Parenthood was closing clinics not because of the law, but because they, were, they wanted to have different standards and so they built a facility like the one we have in St. Paul that is large, has multiple doctors, multiple beds. It was a better commercial or financial approach. There's simply not the population to support it in these other areas. And so it was a business decision. And there's a lot of evidence in the various briefs to, to show that. So, so distribution of clinics, I think if we're going to do that, l then let's look at all the distributions. We've got rural hospitals closing regularly too. So that's just a function of the market to some degree. Um, the question about poor women would suggest that um, women's lives are so, um, it, number one, it would suggest adoption is not a, a realistic or available option, which is, is not true in any state in the union. Uh, placing a child for adoption is a legally available option, and in fact, part of the reason we have a large foreign adoption uh, practice in this country is because children are not available in infancy to parents who want to adopt, and the waiting lists are long, and it costs about 20 grand to adopt unless you're adopting out of the foster care system or other sort of situations. So, so the fact that a woman beyond the nine months must be burdened with the raising of this child, I think again, is an assumption that I don't share. Uh, I, she has other options beyond that. And then finally, I would argue that um, the fact that women have this unique situation uh, of being capable of pregnancy um, is, in the vast majority of cases, um, arises by virtue of voluntary conduct. Um, even the other, even Planned Parenthood and Guttmacher, which is their research institute, it was established by Planned Parenthood. It's now been spun off, and it's a separate, independent organization. But nonetheless, that is their orientation. Uh, the most generous number we can give of pregnancies arising from non-voluntary sex would be 5%. So what we're saying is that women should be free to engage in voluntary acts and that they know with certainty that some percentage are going to result in a pregnancy. <coughs> and yet, because they've engaged in that voluntary act, the child they've created, they have no responsibility to even for that short period of time. We don't typically use that reasoning in other circumstances. We don't say that when we have, where we have voluntarily created circumstances, we get to kill people or other human beings to get out of it. We don't even say that we, you know, get to um, abandon certain responsibilities. Men, for example. 
don't get to. A um, couple of cases that might lighten the mood, although they're weird uh, in this room. Um, there is a California case where a man had both of his parents in the hospital. They were elderly. Uh, he was stressed. Uh, this was his defense. He was stressed. There was a nurse's aide who offered to help him relieve his stress in a linen closet <laughs> orally. <laughs> Um, and she had a uh, condom in her mouth and preserved his sperm and inseminated herself and then sued him for paternity. <laughs> it was very weird. You're absolutely right. It's very weird. Um, but, but the way it relates to our conversation is the court found him liable. The court found him liable. Or there's the case out of Louisiana where the uh, young teen was being babysat by the 30-year-old woman and it constituted rape under the law. And when she bore a child by virtue of the sexual act, sued the young man and his family for paternity and notwithstanding it was a crime, the court basically said, well, I'm sure he enjoyed it and yeah, you're liable for the next 18 years. So this child, all right, I don't really think of 13-year-olds as children, but they're not adults by any long stretch of the imagination, now has child support payments that will accumulate. So we don't excuse men from the consequences of these voluntary acts where women assert their right to that support. Lots don't. Um, I don't know why the law is so different for women. I can, I can make the argument. You want me to make the argument? <laughs> The argument on the other side is the burdens that women experience during pregnancy are unique, and I completely understand that. You know, I was one of those. I like to think I was an aristocrat in some prior lineage. I know I was a farmhand because I can just be pregnant and drop them and go, right? Uh, but my daughters, on the other hand, they have 24/7 morning sickness for the first. You know, so I understand that. Um, but when we look at the statistics on abortion. Uh, in the states that require reporting, which is always a political battle, um, very few of them indicate that they are done for the health of the mother. And in Minnesota, we actually had litigation over that, and it's a, a minute number that are implicated by, the, by maintaining the health of the woman. I think we have time for just one more question. Yes, sir. I very much appreciate your um, rigor and... Um, thinking and sensitivity to some very provocative and painful and difficult subjects. Uh, what I want to ask you takes off on a slightly different track. Thank that, you. <laughs> well, just slightly, <laughs> though, that, that, that you're pursuing. And, and that's, um, you know, there's a great deal of political consternation in this country and, and a great deal of political divide in this country. And to me, the solutions for it in a, in a partisan political sense are somewhat straightforward. They you know, deal with redistricting and gerrymandering and term limits and the like, which may or may, or may not have some impact. What I struggle with is how the issues that the court deals with can facilitate any type of healing. And it, it, one of the things that I was drawn to was the Marbury case that gave the court the authority to be the final arbitrator of constitutional questions. And um, you seem to be somewhat pessimistic, perhaps I'm reading into it, that that could ever be changed or modified. But is there a way, uh, because for me personally, a lot of my energy is to healing the political breach in this country, though quite candidly, I tend to side with you and your position you. on many uh, of the issues that you've raised. But I'm even, I have a, what I consider a, a higher calling, which is to look at how we can kind of heal some of the political divide. And I, in my mind's eye, can see that with the executive branch and the legislative branch, I have more difficulty envisioning that with the courts. And I wonder if there is any way in which that can happen from your vantage point. So let me, I'm a trained moderator for the Better Angels Project. If you're not familiar with it, let me recommend you become familiar with it. Uh, 
and Professor Doherty at the University of Minnesota. You're, uh, you're, all right. I the am library a, is involved with it. I am a huge interested. fan of the Better Angels Project where you take, and they identify you as, I am a red moderator. I also am trained to do just general moderation, but I am a red, and I'm going to make an assumption, but you may be a blue moderator. <laughs> All right. But the purpose is to bring together groups of citizens that self-identify as red and as blue and have really hard conversations in a safe environment. And I think that is a wonderful organization, and I would encourage you to look into it and invite Better Angels to come into your churches or your schools or whatever community organizations you have to have these conversations because they are extremely helpful. I could do another 10 minutes on the way other countries deal with the judicial supremacy, including Canada and England, but I see that our time is out. And again, you all have been a wonderful audience, especially as provoking as I have been to some of you. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.